Hi, I'm Story Powell with the Utah Assistive Technology Program, and I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to welcome you to our training, Eagle Eyes Eye Control Mouse Technology. Uh, this training is made possible by the Utah Assistive Technology Program, and you can find more out about our programs online at www.uatpat.org. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. And you can also find all of our previous webinars archived on YouTube. The links to all of those are at the bottom of our website. Today, if you're interested in a certificate of attendance, you can let me know through the chat function, which is on the bottom of the AggieCast page titled, Ask a Question. I'd ask you to log in, please, using your real name. And once I've uh, acknowledged your request for the certificate, you can send me an email with your mailing address so I can send the certificate there afterwards. And we'd also ask you to take the evaluation after the training, and the link to that is also located on the bottom of the AggieCast page, titled UATP Survey. And today, if you'd like to ask the presenter a question as we go along, you can relay those to me using the Ask a Question button on the AggieCast page, and I will uh, moderate and have those uh, asked to our presenter. And I'd also remind you to not use this area to ask myself or others about technical difficulties. It's only for presentation questions. If you are having technical difficulties, things that can help would include updating your browser and uh, refreshing your browser. And if that doesn't work, you can call the USU IT department, and that phone number is also on the bottom of the AggieCast page. So now I will introduce our presenter and training topic. Uh, Adam, Ad, excuse me, Andrew Leffler will be presenting the webinar. He is the Director of Operations for the Opportunity Foundation of America, the sole manufacturer, distributor, and trainer of the Eagle Eyes technology. He has experience as an educator, as a chief flight instructor and adjunct faculty at Utah Valley University, where he developed unique and innovative curriculum and implemented standardization of teaching and training. He has been involved with the Eagle Eyes project for three years, starting out as a volunteer before becoming project developer and director of operations to enhance the service, support, and accessibility of the Eagle Eyes technology. His background in business technology and education brings a unique perspective to the special needs community. The innovative technology of Eagle Eyes allows individuals to control a computer mouse simply with the movement of their eyes. Developed at Boston College, the eye-controlled computer mouse makes using a computer possible for individuals unable to properly use their hands for standard computer use. It is a unique device that serves a specific demographic of individuals who experience limited dexterity or complete paralysis and or lack of full purposeful head movement. Because of its unique technology, it's a device that will work for many individuals when other devices have failed. Eagle Eyes can be used for recreation, communication, and education. And now we will turn the time to Andrew. All right, thanks for joining us. So I'm with the Opportunity Foundation of America and we are a nonprofit that has partnered with Boston College uh, to present the Eagle Eyes Project. And our objectives today, we're gonna go over a brief history of Eagle Eyes, what Eagle Eyes is and how it compares to other devices out there, uh, how it's being used and then a brief overview uh, and training of the actual Eagle Eyes itself uh, so that you can be familiar with how it works and, and how easy it is actually to use. So the Opportunity Foundation of America, our vision statement is to improve the quality of life for children and adults with severe physical challenges and their families through recreation, education, and communication. And right now we do that with Eagle Eyes, uh, mainly as our sole, uh, sole device. So the history of Eagle Eyes is really interesting. I really love it. It was developed at Boston College in 1994 by Professor Jim Gipps. And they actually got together, just a group of them one summer, and were just goofing around and said, hey, what could we do? Let's hook ourselves up and see if we can control a computer with our eyes. Well, they did, and they succeeded with it. So in 1994, they actually were a finalist in the Tech of the Year uh, uh, with Discover Magazine, who did a TV show with it. Well, from that TV show, a mother uh, saw that, Kathy Nash, and immediately called up Jim Gibson and said, hey, I have a son with cerebral palsy and we wanna come down and use your device. And Jim Gibbs kind of backed off and said, I, I, I don't know, I'm a little hesitant. We haven't really used it for anything. Um, this is just something we kind of made for fun. And she was very insistent and finally got her son down there and he was the first user of it. And as soon as Jim Gibbs 
saw uh, Michael using it, he knew that this is what the technology had been developed for. It was for these kids with special needs. So it was used at Boston College Campus School for 10 years before it was publicly distributed. And that's where the Opportunity Foundation came in, uh, in helping to then miniaturize the Eagle Eyes unit into a, the small unit you can see on your screen there. So as a nonprofit, we are a charity composed of mostly volunteers and we're supported by generous donations. Uh, we were established in 2000 by a group of caring executives and you'll meet our executive director here in a little bit. She'll be our guinea pig to get hooked up today. Um, and in 2005, we signed an exclusive license agreement with Boston College uh, to manufacture, distribute, and provide the training for Eagle Eyes. Uh, Opportunity Foundation of America is not a vendor. Uh, we do simply request a donation to cover the cost of the technology, so the actual manufacturing cost of the technology. Um, and that cost, we have now gotten down to $800. Uh, and that covers the cost of the console, the electrodes, and all of that's manufactured here in the United States so that we actually have control over it. Um, and then training costs can average between about two and three hundred dollars. Um, and then from there we provide free support to all of our users after that. We have a very extensive uh, website that we've tried to develop and provide that ongoing support to help them to continue to use it. Uh, now any of you who are familiar with assistive technology, you know how cheap eight hundred dollars is because other assistive devices range anywhere from five to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars uh, and so that's been our goal as a nonprofit is to keep that cost as low as we can to be able to get this technology out there to those who need it. So how does it work? Eagle Eyes has five electrodes and these five electrodes are placed on the face, two horizontal and then two vertical to pick up the signal of the eye and it actually picks up what's called the EOG and that is the signal that the eye creates when it rotates. Um, so with those, there's a fifth electrode that's placed on the forehead as a ground reference signal for all the electrodes to work together. And I found it very interesting. I was asking Jim Gibbs one day, uh, you know, is it complicated how this works? And he says, actually, you'd be amazed. It's fairly simple. It's really just math. It takes the ground signal minus this plus this equals movement. And so he made it sound so simple. <laughs> Um, but it's very, very amazing what it does. So then the electrodes are then run through the Eagle Eyes unit, the console, uh, and then that goes through USB cable to the software on the computer, which then turns it into the mouse movement on the screen. So Eagle Eyes is a mouse replacement system. So you can use it on anything on your computer. Uh, the limitations are that Eagle Eyes can only do a single mouse click. So it can't do click and drag, you can't do double click. Um, but any program that allows you to do simply a single click, you can use Eagle Eyes with. So it's very uh, broad in what you can do. It's, you don't have to stick to a certain software to use. Uh, you can use it with anything that you already have on a computer. A lot of people use existing board makers or uh, online programs such as Starfall, things like that. So to create a mouse click, it uses what's called dwell time. So the user has to focus on a certain object or icon for a specific amount of time and then that creates a click. And that dwell time is set by the facilitator. So the facilitator will set uh, the dwell time and that can be increased or decreased depending on the activity that you're doing. Uh, now the goal is, is to increase the dwell time so that they have to focus longer and be more deliberate in their choice. Um, but basically the eyes replace the mouse. And so they are now able to start to uh, recreate, educate, and hopefully everybody hopes that they can someday communicate also. So Eagle Eyes is primarily for children and adults with severe special needs. Um, generally nonverbal or paralyzed uh, and have maybe at best a yes-no method of communication. Uh, completely locked in a lot of times is what we find on some of them. Um, but we really have a broader demographic. Uh, this last year especially we've really discovered that you know, it can be used by anyone as an assistive device. It allows free play and control um, as a mouse replacement. So we've had a lot of people who are using switches, but switches don't allow you to have the free control that using a mouse does. And so uh, we've found a much broader demographic who can use it. So really, the way I like to say it is, Eagle Eyes can be for anyone who has limited dexterity. So what can Eagle Eyes do? Um, imagine being locked in your body. Of course, you guys have probably, a lot of you have maybe worked with people uh, who are locked in their body. And uh, go back just a little bit to Jim Gibbs again. Jim Gibbs had a really neat experience where he actually went in for surgery 
And when he woke up, the anesthesia had not worn off yet. And so all he could do was open his eyes. And he looked around the room and looked at the nurse. Nurse didn't even acknowledge that he was there. And he tried to get, a, you know, to get her attention, blinking his eyes, doing anything he could. And all of a sudden, it hit him. And he said, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to use my own technology. I hope it works. And that was one more experience for him that really solidified why he needs to get this out to, uh, to people is because to be able to, to feel that helpless feeling was just incredible for him. So what can we do with Eagle Eyes? We can play and recreate. We can learn cause and effect. We can communicate, education and learning, um, exercising independence. And in my opinion, the most important thing is showing your true intelligence. So many of these kids have been diagnosed with the mentality of an infant or a one-year-old or a two-year-old. And once they get hooked up to Eagle Eyes, they prove very quickly that they are much advanced beyond that. So the effects of Eagle Eyes that we found, um, we're a nonprofit, we're not an expert. And so as we go along, we keep on finding more and more uh, about what this technology can do for people. Uh, some of the things we found is stimulating the visual cortex. It wakes up the mind. Um, some of these kids, they have no interaction. They, they don't do anything independent. And so to be able to do that for the first time just wakes them up. Um, it teaches the users to focus and improve eye movement. Um, if you think of it as physical therapy for the eyes, uh, you have some people, we had one lady who had had a stroke and she could just barely move her eyes just a little bit. And after several months of using Eagle Eyes, she almost had her full range of, of moving her eyes back. So one of those unintended good consequences. Um, it challenges the user and it creates awareness of self that they do exist and that they actually can be a part of the world around them. Um, we talked about revealing their true intelligence um, and allowing them sometimes for the first form of independence to actually be able to make a choice and to be heard. Um, and then it teaches the user to become engaged and calm. A lot of times we, we work with children who have different, uh, for example, Rett syndrome, where the girls wring their hands all the time and when they start using eagle eyes, it's amazing. All of a sudden they just kind of get calm and some of those behaviors stop because they become so focused. And they've never really had anything to focus them before to really demand their attention. So two examples here. We're going to go on kind of the broad spectrum of Eagle Eyes. We have Michael Nash, who was our very first user of Eagle Eyes. And of course, he had to be the rock star of Eagle Eyes because he used it to graduate mainstream high school. So here's a 12-year-old boy who his mother had been told, he has the mentality of a six-month-old, he, he sticks out his tongue all the time, don't, don't even try. He was a 12-year-old boy inside of a 12-year-old body, just stuck. So he graduated mainstream high school using Eagle Eyes and has now gone on to actually be a assistive technology tester for the state of Massachusetts. I always forget that one. Now, on the other hand, we have Derek Fulmer. Derek Fulmer uh, had no emotion, flat affect, didn't smile, didn't laugh, nothing. After about two or three weeks of using Eagle Eyes, all of a sudden it woke up his brain, laughing, smiling, and his mom said that she could do without the crying, <laughs> but he now plays, he's a person. Uh, he just had never ever had anything to stimulate him before, and so the brain had literally gone dormant as he just sat in the chair and watched the world around him. Um, and now he's a, he's a part of that, and he's a part of his family again. Success with Eagle Eyes is measured at the level of each user. To us, if Eagle Eyes simply allows the individual the ability to play a game and to recreate and know that they're the ones doing it, that is success right there. That is the improvement in the quality of their life. If they never move on to education or communication, it doesn't matter because we all like to sit down and play a game. But the awareness that it's them doing it, uh, we see that all the time where we have one school that uses it in a classroom setting, and, when they, and they all watch each other use it. And when they're watching, they don't react the same as when they're actually doing it. They know it's them. And the joy that that brings to them to be able to actually do something, even if it is just to make a silly alien dance on the screen, to them, that's an improvement in quality of life. So that's really what we look for, is it changes lives as it validates the intellect of these individuals. Uh, so success with Eagle Eyes is simply an improvement in the quality of their life. And that's what we look for as a foundation. 
Now, other eye tracking devices, if any of you have maybe heard of Toby or Dynavox, they use an infrared uh, light that actually, infrared light that bounces off of the retina and then it tracks it, very similar to when you take a bad picture and you get red eye. Um, that's literally how it works, is it basically creates red eye and then tracks your pu pupil as it moves around. The problem with these devices is that they usually run way too fast for our demographic. Uh, infrared devices work really, really well for uh, MS, Lou Gehrig's, uh, those type of illnesses where maybe they were once full functioning and now they, they don't have all, all of their function anymore. Um, the problem is, is the infrared, it doesn't move with the user. It actually requires the user to hold fairly still. And every time they move, you have to recalibrate it. Um, and it doesn't work well for peripheral users. So a lot of our kids, uh, especially the ones who went through oxygen deprivation, the center of their vision is actually gone. They're actually blind. And so they will actually look off to the side. Meanwhile, the screen's over here, and they will be playing and not even looking at it. Um, and the infrared devices are not as forgiving for those kind of users. So infrared devices really are not a competitor to Eagle Eyes. Eagle Eyes really is one step before that. Uh, we would hope that people could use Eagle Eyes and possibly graduate into an infrared device. But Eagle Eyes itself is not a competitor. It's, it's very different. Um, Eagle Eyes is adaptable to the user. Um, it's their paradigm, not ours. If they are in their chair with their head tilted over, that's fine. We'll show you in a minute on the software where we can adjust for that. If they move around a lot, that's okay. We can recenter and recalibrate them with a click of two buttons. There's no calibration process. Um, it allows them to be themselves and use it in their way. So we can use, move our eyes in two different ways. One is I can hold my head straight and I can move my eyes. Or I can keep my eyes focused on something and move my head. Now when I move my head, if I move my head to the right, I'm actually looking to the left. And so the users figure this out very quickly where they will look at an object and then realize, oh, I'm not quite there. And then they'll move their head down and hit the object. Um, and so it allows them to, to be able to use head movement sometimes to actually augment their use. Whereas an infrared device, head movement is a deterrent. Um, and so it really gives them that freedom to be able to do. Now, one thing I really want to mention here is that Eagle Eyes is an eye controlled technology. It's not an eye tracking technology. Now the difference between there, an infrared device is an eye tracking technology. It is a specific reference of where your eye is actually looking on the screen. Eagle Eyes is a little bit more like driving a car. It's a learned skill. The very first time you try to drive a car, you probably hit the brake and almost put your mother through the windshield. So same thing with Eagle Eyes. The first time that you, you maybe try it, it's not exactly this perfect science because you have to learn how to use it. And each individual can learn how to do it differently. Michael Nash used to stick his tongue out when he was trying to get into a certain corner. That's what did it for him. Um, and that was how he was able to do it. So Eagle Eyes is a lot more adaptable and a lot more uh, flexible to the users, especially for our demographic. A lot of uh, cerebral palsy, um, di uh, disabilities like that. So Eagle Eyes distribution, we currently have over 275 systems distributed throughout the US and Canada. Uh, we've got a couple overseas, but not too many right now. And half of those are in schools and organizations, the other half are in homes, and we do have systems in about six universities. The estimated demographic for Eagle Eyes in the U.S. is about 60,000 people. Um, and our goals by 2015 is to be above 375 um, and being able to get more tools out there to be able to assess uh, where these students are really at and assess what they actually know already. Um, they've been sitting in a chair and observing for years and it's amazing how much they have already learned just by sitting there. But how do we assess that? How do we find out uh, what they do know? Um, and our hopes is to find someone who can do a research project for us to be able to validate the results that we've already seen. But of course, there's some people who say, show me the, show me the research project or I won't believe it. And so we hope to be able to accomplish that, to be able to have uh, further proof of what we've already experienced. Um, and then adding curriculum and use improvements, um, adding more content for people to be able to use uh, and to do. Sometimes teachers have a, a lot of things that they can do with it, but parents often struggle to find enough content 
Uh, so that's part of what we want to do is continue to develop that for them and have more content available and then also increase our training and support. So we're going to go through how Eagle Eyes is being used. It's used for recreation, education, communication, and we talk about a focus training tool. And we've also found a new area of tactile disorder where kids who don't like to touch things um, will use Eagle Eyes because they don't have to use their hands. Um, and then also the eye training and strengthening. So we'll give you a bunch of scenarios here that we've seen. So recreation, we all have heard the value of play-based learning. We all love to play, it's the funnest way to do it, and there's, of course, in the education world, that's a huge thing of how we learn. That's how we naturally develop. And a lot of these kids, they never got to roll around on the floor. They never got to roll the ball and have the ball come back to them. They never got to push the glass of water over on the table and see it spill everywhere. And so they've, they've never experienced that play-based learning. So a lot of times the recreation is the first step. That's where they get to start doing that. They get to learn the cause and effect uh, relationships that they missed. But now through a computer, hopefully, we can create some of those scenarios for them and develop those, those synapses in the brain uh, so that they, they can move on from there. Um, we hear a lot of times from people, well, we already have an assistive device. This person uses switches to communicate. We don't need anything else. And it always makes me laugh when I hear that because I wake up in the morning, I check my iPhone, I log into the internet, I go and turn on my computer. If I use five devices in one day, why can't they? Uh, once again, Eagle Eyes allows them the free play. So if they have a communication device already that works, great. But can they go on and play a game? Can they go on and have that free play and that freedom to actually do something uh, a little bit more. And so that joy of independent play just cannot be stressed enough. And the last one is the interaction with others. We get emails probably at least once a month from people that say, uh, from parents, that say, you know, if my child never uses Eagle Eyes to communicate with me, it's okay. Because for the first time, they are the center of attention. Rather than sitting in a room while the family does something else, they are the center of attention. They are the ones doing the activity while the rest of the family is cheering them on. Uh, we have a couple of videos on our website of it where the boys are, they've memorized the songs of the different games and they're just cheering on. And a lot of moms have said, thank you. Thank you for allowing our family to be together, to be normal. Um, and so having that interaction, this picture you can see on your screen right now is actually some high school volunteers uh, that went out and one of the biggest things that that did is really created the f friends. The fact that they actually had friends that came and played with them and, and cared about them and sat with them and being able to have that experience. And it wasn't just friends who came and sat with them, it was friends who played with them. And so right there alone, I could stop there and say that's all Eagle Eyes does and that would be enough. <laughs> but it can go on, we can do more. We are using it as education, so we have a progression. First of all, on some of the, you know, some of the kids are very well able, and once you get them on Eagle Eyes, they can start doing tasks immediately. But a lot of times we have to start down from the bottom. So we go into cause and effect. Once they've learned cause and effect, we go into choice selection. From choice selection, we go into multiple choice, concentration and memory type games to be able to, once again, we've got to develop those synapses that have never developed in their brain. So once we've developed that, now we can start moving into maybe educational type based activities. Um, you can see in this picture, this is actually a teacher who does use it in the classroom and they literally use it as a class and select uh, items there. Um, it, it can be used in an IEP. Now in the IEP, I know if any of your teachers out there, you're saying, oh, I can't list a device in an IEP. It's okay. We have a lot of teachers who list it as we are going to use eye gaze in the IEP. Well, it just so happens we're going to use Eagle Eyes as that eye gaze device. Um, and so it can be used in education in so many more ways and, and be able to, to give them that freedom. So um, being able to increase to that point. Now, this is one of those, um, I guess, unintended good consequences is the last one is it trains them for use with a standalone eye gaze. Uh, so we had a teacher that came running up to us. It was actually one of the aides in a class. And she said, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you won't believe it, what we were doing. We were up on a whiteboard, 
And we had selections there. And because of eagle eyes, this girl had learned that, oh, I can use my eyes to make selections. And so she has used eagle eyes to basically now graduate into using standalone communication boards and uh, eye gaze type boards. So that was something that we had never thought of, that it can be a tool to take them to other things, to other levels that maybe would be more useful. Um, because as you see, we'll, you'll see later, we'll hook up the electrodes, and obviously you can't have the electrodes on all day. So being able to get them to do something with a standalone board would be fantastic. Now using it for communication, if some of you are familiar with board maker software, where you can put buttons on a screen and then they could select a button to then communicate, um, those are very, very common. Now later I will show you one of those. We actually have a gentleman up in Washington who is currently developing a free board maker for us uh, that we can distribute to anyone, so it's free to anyone. Um, it is still in beta right now, so if you download it and find some bugs, go ahead and report them. Um, but board makers, being able to do choice selection, feeling board, um, one of the things we'd like to do is be able to create a word book using, because you can link the boards together like a website. So they could basically navigate their own word book and be able to go and tell you what they want to tell you. Uh, some of the teachers have come up with great ideas of having mom put a picture of their vacation with a paragraph of what they did so they could come to school and do show and tell, just like the rest of us, and, and be able to tell what they did on their, on their vacation. The other one was quick fire comments. Um, some of these kids are, are very, very, very smart. And so they made a board with these quick fire comments of like, oh, really? I didn't know that. What are you talking about? And so here's this kid in the middle of a room, and he's the center of attention, making these smart aleck comments that every teenager loves to make. Um, so letting them be normal, a normal person. And then, of course, telling jokes. That's a favorite one of a lot of the boys. They love to tell jokes. Now, using it as a focus training tool, uh, we had some preliminary use this summer with ADD and autism. Uh, it actually came, we were actually at a conference that was very heavily attended by a lot of parents with aut autistic kids. And they came up to us when they saw the electrodes and said, oh my goodness, is this um, biofeedback? And we said, no, no, it's not biofeedback. But as they watched how it worked and the focus that was required in order to use it, uh, they started to wonder, wow, I wonder if this really would work for them. So we started to do that. And then coincidentally, we got a call from a organization up in Washington that is now using Eagle Eyes to test it in the biotherapy uh, spectrum uh, and being able to do that. So something that we never even thought of or could have imagined, but other people saw the technology and adapted it to that. Um, it helps to improve the eye gaze and the controlled eye movement. Um, and also it helps you to see where the user is looking. So we talked about the peripheral vision before. And a lot of times we go into the classroom and the teacher says, you know, I get right in front of him and he looks away from me. I just, I don't know why he won't look at me. Well, we hook him up to eagle eyes and sure enough, there's the computer screen right in front of him and what does he do? He goes off to the side and starts playing games. He's a peripheral user. He doesn't have the center vision. So it's not that he's looking away from you, it's that he can't see you when you're right in front of him. And so eagle eyes has been able to help us to see how these kids see because they all see differently depending on their disability. Um, some of these kids have amazing vision. Uh, you and me, when we grow up, we learn to walk. So we look straight in front of us. Then we learn to read, and we look straight in front of us. And soon we just start, stop paying attention to all this around us, all this peripheral vision that's around us. And so I'm sure you guys have had the experience where you've walked through the hallway and you've walked right past your best friend and they say, hey, did you not see me? No, I really didn't. <laughs> I don't use my peripheral vision. Well, these kids are stuck in a wheelchair. Their peripheral vision is phenomenal because they don't need to pay attention to what's right in front of them. They see the whole room. And so it's really fun to go in when we do trainings because a lot of times the, uh, the individual with disabilities does much better than if we hook up the parents. So, and that's because they don't have expectations. They use their eyes differently and they're more relaxed. Uh, and then once again, we talk about it focuses the mind. So a lot of those, those habits kind of stop and we see that they become very focused. Now back on the autism, I did this with one individual who um, I've known him for several years and he's always you know, playing with his fingers and just does not stop. 
And so we tried doing eagle eyes with him, and sure enough, as soon as we did eagle eyes, his hands went down on his lap, and he became so focused that I've never seen him hold that still in my life. Even to this day, he doesn't hold that still. So we're kind of interested to see how that goes as a focus training tool. We talked about tactile disorder. Uh, this cute little guy on your screen, his name is Gabe, and yet he's always dressed to the nines like that. Cutest little guy. Uh, tactile disorder, though, which is funny because in this picture he's playing with the, with the device. But he will not use a computer mouse, he won't touch a keyboard, nothing. But we put eagle eyes on him, and he just sits there and starts moving around and playing and just loves it. So part of what we've kind of experimented with is if having those electrodes on is some sort of a physical cue to these kids that, hey, I am now empowered to do something. Um, because I'm going to show you here in a minute another device called Camera Mouse, which simply uses a web camera to be able to control, control a computer with your head movement. Um, and we tried both of those. And when you did Camera Mouse, they were still all over the place and jumping back and forth. But when we did Eagle Eyes, and those electrodes, there was something that just caused them to really focus and to really bring it in. So, um, and one of the big things that we focus on there is enabling versus restricting. Uh, when, we, when we put these electrodes on in a moment, we have a lot of people who say, I don't know, those electrodes all over the face, that it's so restricting. And my, my response to that is, let me lock you in your body and you'll be begging me for these on your face. <laughs> but very realistically, it's not restrictive. They don't care what they look like. They don't care that there's tape on their face. Uh, that, that's one of those comments that makes me chuckle every time. Oh, it looks, it looks so bad. Can't we use clear tape? Do you think they really care? They are playing a game right now that they've never, ever been able to do before. Um, but because of the tape, uh, I want to address this because everybody always asks, well, can't we do a mask? Or maybe could you, couldn't you put it on glasses or something? And if you think about it, a mask or glasses is way more invasive and restrictive. But not only that, but if you bump the glasses or mask, it moves all the electrodes and you lose reference. So the tape actually is the most enabling way to do it because we use those little pieces of tape and then they can move their head around any way they want. It doesn't, it doesn't restrict them at all. It actually gives them the most uh, freedom possible by doing that. The last one is eye training and strengthening. So we talked about being able to do that where they can increase that motion if they don't have the full eye motion. Strengthening the ocular muscles. Um, it really does. I've, it's taken me probably, I don't think I had really, really good grasp of eagle eyes for probably five hours uh, of use. And, and the reason of that is because it's just like any other skill we do is you're creating a fine motor movement that you've never created before. So you're learning a new thing. It's like writing. If you try to write with your non-dominant hand, it looks like chicken scratch because you just don't have that fine motor movement that you've developed in your other hand. So it's the same thing with our eyes. We develop that fine, fine motor movement. Um, but it also improves their peripheral vision use also. Um, sometimes they have to look a little bit beyond the target to hit the target and use their peripheral vision. Um, and so they learn to do that. Now, because eagle eyes actually measures the angular movement of the eyes, um, it doesn't matter where their head is in relation to the screen, but one of the things in, in training is that you need to have the screen close enough to them that it occupies most of their field of vision. So if you're using a big overhead projector, that's really nice. They can be four feet away from it, and it works well. If they're using a laptop screen, they need to be fairly close to it, within about a foot of it. But say, having said that, whenever I use my laptop, I'm usually within about a foot of it. So it's no different than normal use there. Um, but if they are far away from the screen, obviously I'm going to have smaller eye movements, and so I'm not going to get full control of the screen. Okay, now I wanted to mention Camera Mouse here real fast. Camera Mouse was developed by Jim Gibbs also. So what happened is uh, they, they got Eagle Eyes up and running. And like we talked about, if I move my head to the right, I look to the left. So what he did is in the software, there's a setting where you can flip it so that it reverses the signal so that you can actually use your head movement to control the mouse. Well, after having done that, he said, wouldn't it be great if the people who have head movement 
we could do it without the electrodes. So he took the same software that runs Eagle Eyes and adapted it for a web camera. So on this picture, you can see there's my ugly face on there with a big green dot. And that's all you do is you put the green dot right on the face and then it tracks that pixel movement around the screen and they are uh, able to now control a computer simply with their head. Um, it works on Windows and it is a free download. So Jim Gibbs said, this is software, I'm not gonna charge for it. So it's a free download available to anybody who wants it. Um, and we'll show it a little bit later, but it's cameramouse.org. Cameramouse.org, you can download it onto your PC, try it out, um, and it's amazing. It's very, very accurate. Um, and so anybody who has purposeful head movement, camera mouse is the answer to that. And if they don't have purposeful head movement, then eagle eyes is, is the answer. And so we're able to offer both of these technologies so when we go out and evaluate someone, we can say, okay, let's try camera mouse first if we've got some purposeful head movement. Um, but sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes someone with purposeful head movement doesn't mean that they can actually purposefully control with it. And so uh, that they would end up being an Eagle Eyes user. So here's just a quick list of some free tools and software. Cameramouse.org, we just talked about that. Midas Touch is an on-screen keyboard that was developed for Eagle Eyes. Staggered Speech is another one. Um, so very, very basic, these are all free. And then Herbie Speaks, we're gonna show you that in a little bit, that is a free board maker. Herbie.org is where that is. And we're going to continue to work with him and develop that. He's very excited because he's made other apps for uh, people with disabilities before, and they haven't been successful. And so he's very, very excited to, to get this one out there. And then we also, on our website, we try to maintain a library of activities um, for, for use with Eagle Eyes so that if you need more activities, you can go on there and find them. Or if you have something that you really enjoy, maybe you found a website you really like, you can add that and submit it to us and we'll add it for everybody else to be able to use also. Okay, so really fast, I want to show you camera mouse. So you can see on the screen, there it is. So you can see you pull up camera mouse and all you have to do is tag the user so there's my nose. At that point, I can come back to a game. And it is now, that's only head movement. And you can see how precisely that tracks. So camera mouse can be used to literally navigate an entire computer if you wanted to. Um, it has that ability to be able to do. Now, Eagle Eyes is a little bit more sensitive. It's picking up, the electrodes pick up a thousandth of a volt. So it's a little bit more sensitive technology. And so the Eagle Eyes is not going to have the precision that Camera Mouse has. So that's why if they have purposeful head movement, Camera Mouse is the better option, and it's free. Who doesn't like free? So that's kind of there. So I'm gonna show you now we're going to do a quick training on the Eagle Eyes itself. So we have the Eagle Eyes console right here. And the Eagle Eyes console is, has been developed to be very simple. It uses, it's actually powered off of the USB on the computer. So you, it's pretty much a plug and play device. Now, uh, the older version was powered by nine volt batteries, but we were able to redesign that, thank goodness, and get rid of the batteries. And so now it's much easier to use, um, but very simple. You can see the controls here. We have first our offset sliders, and our offset sliders literally set the center point of the cursor. So when I, down here I have my auto center buttons, and when I push those auto center buttons, it centers to wherever these cursors are set. Now the reason that that's important is, if I'm playing an activity where all of the, um, all of the options are at the bottom of the screen, then I wanna lower my center point a little bit because I don't want to make them have to go all the way down every time. So I lower the center point so that they can access uh, the selections easier. Now, the other thing is, if you have a kid who's in a wheelchair, they're tipped back and their eyes are looking up and the screen is down here, their, their uh, vertical motion down is going to be very, very limited. And so that's another situation where I would bring their center down 
so that they don't have to travel so far. And so that just allows us to adjust the center point. Once you have those set for a certain activity, you really don't touch them. They stay right where they are. And then all we have to do is recenter, recalibrate. So if they move their head to a new position, we push the auto center buttons and they're recentered and ready to go um, for their new position. And so very easy to calibrate. These knobs right here with the blue on them, these are the sensitivity. And we normally are going to set those between a 9 and a 12 o'clock position. 12 o'clock obviously being more sensitive. If you go much above a 12 o'clock position, it gets really sensitive and very jumpy. So usually no higher than a 12 o'clock position on those. And usually that's one thing that you just set right at the beginning and you're done. So I set those. The way we train it is as soon as I begin, I make sure that I've got my levers set center over center. Make sure I've got these between 9 and 12 o'clock. Push my auto center buttons, and I'm ready to play. And it's that easy of a setup. Now, the switch in the middle here, this allows me to switch between eagle eyes control and, and mouse control. So that right there is what allows me to give them control, and I have control. And one of the big, uh, important things is when you're using this is to tell them, you have control, now I have control. Otherwise, if you take control and start moving the mouse, they get very frustrated because they're not moving it. Uh, and so you need to always verbalize everything that you're doing to them. Uh, explain activities as you play them. What is the purpose of the activity? Nobody's ever told me. We all need instructions. Um, so giving them instructions helps. But that's the console. Now on the top, right there is where the electrodes plug in. For this demo, I have a, a test cable plugged in so that it will, it will center these up. Otherwise, it would just be picking up static in the air. Uh, but you can see that these levers actually move. You can see the green light that moves with the lever. And that is the actual position of the cursor on the screen as I move those. So uh, if we can bring up real quick the screen, the screen and the console, so you can see both of those together. We've got, you can see, I'll show you how it actually does move exactly where it's supposed to go. So when you're, when you're using this, there's no way to cheat. So there's no way for them to cheat when they're doing it. The only way to cheat is if you actually uh, move the control levers for them. So if we can see the control levers up there also, see the console with our screen. There we go. OK. So now you can see, as I move it, I'm going to put it over to Eagle Eyes Control. And now you can see that it literally moves with that lever. So you could cheat and move those levers like a little joystick, and then it would hit the alien for them, and then that's cheating because you're doing it for them. So, and then there's my vertical. So you can see how I can set my vertical position, push my center buttons, it recenters it, um, and I can set that position for wherever is needed. Now, having said that, here's the one disclaimer. If you have someone who's really trying, sometimes the corners are really hard to hit, and they're really trying to hit those corners, and maybe what you do is you take that lever and you move their center up just a little bit because they're having a hard time getting up top, that's not cheating. If you hit it for them, that's cheating. So your job as a facilitator is to be able to give them the best accessibility to whatever they're doing. So that's the console. Um, it has a USB that then runs over to the computer. And now we have our software. And here's our software window. And you can see on our software that we have the first option is the mouse click. So we can turn the mouse click on or we can turn it off. So depending on the activity, maybe we don't want them to be able to click with the mouse, so we can turn it off. Now we talked about dwell time. And the way that the mouse works is based on how long they focus on an object, and then it automatically creates a click. So our settings, in order to do that, the first setting is the radius. So we have 30 pixel radius. So as long as they, basically, as long as the mouse does not move more than 30 pixels within a certain amount of time, it will click. So that's the radius. The radius, we always leave at 30. Um, it seems to be a very, very usable um, amount. We've never, I've never had to change it. Um, and I've done some pretty detailed things with it before. So that seems to be a really good setting that they've put in as a default. And I have to agree with it. Now, our next setting is the dwell time. Our dwell time 
is what we talked about. This is how long they have to focus. And it starts at 0.1 seconds, which is basically instant. So 0.1 seconds, I click and I'm going. But I can go up uh, even higher if I need to. If I want to do focus training, I can go really high to where I really want them to focus and hold a certain position. Um, but for general use, generally our goal is to get them to about 0 0.5, 0 0.7 seconds, about a half a second. And that doesn't sound very long to me or you, but if I hook you up to eagle eyes, it becomes a really long time to hold something perfectly still within 30 pixel area. So about a half a second, 0.7 seconds, is what will give them the ability to be able to make selections without accidentally clicking on things on their way over. If I have a bunch of different things to select from, I don't want to accidentally click on my way over. I want to make sure that I'm deliberately focusing on an item. Um, now the last setting is the recovery time. And the recovery time it basically tells the software, after you've clicked, you have to wait this amount of time before you can click again. And a really good example of where I'm going to use that is this game right here. This is just an animal game. And what we have here is if I mouse over the animal, it appears. If I click, it makes a noise. Well, if I don't have a recovery time set in, it gets really, really annoying really fast. So I set in a recovery time of, say, one second, where it, has one, it makes a noise. It has to wait a second before it can click again, and then it clicks again. So between the combination, the combination of the dwell time and the recovery time, uh, those settings is what's going to enable them to have the ability to do what they need to, um, to be able to make selections without accidentally clicking and be more deliberate. Now, the damping is basically a shock absorber. Our face is producing all sorts of electrical energy. Um, this is especially important when we have kids, say, for example, who have uh, seizures. So if they had a seizure that morning, they might need a higher damping setting because there's just a lot of electrical energy going on inside. Um, with little girls with Rett syndrome, I usually have to use between about an 8 and a 10 because they just they create an immense amount of energy. So the shock absorber just smooths out the signal. Now, generally, we're going to use about a 4 to an 8 is normal range. So between a 4 and an 8 is going to give them the ability. And what that does is it just stops it so that if the cursor is kind of jumpy on the screen, it just smooths it out so that it's not so jumpy. Now, here's that setting we talked about with the head and the eyes. Um, like we said, this is really not uh, needed anymore because if they're a head user, Camera mouse is a much better option. They don't have to wear the electrodes. Um, but the head function still does work. Um, so that is an option that, uh, that they could use. Now, the one area that we have seen that this might actually be applicable is in someone who has purposeful head movement yet moves around a lot. Um, because in camera mouse, you have to keep re-tagging their nose in order to recenter it. Whereas in eagle eyes, all you have to do is press those white buttons to recenter it. So Eagle Eyes possibly could be a better head device in that situation. So we always leave it on eyes, though, for normal operation. And then here's the head angle. So if I have someone who is in their wheelchair and they're stuck sideways um, with their he head permanently over, or that's just where they're comfortable. They just are comfortable with their, maybe their head slumped down a little bit because their, their neck just isn't strong enough. That's fine. Uh, we want them to be comfortable in their position. The worst thing is when the parents say, Oh, hold your, hold your head up, hold your head up. No, that's not how it works. We want it to be adjusted to them in their world, in their paradigm. So we can just adjust for the head angle, and all that does is rotates the signal so that it becomes a diagonal signal instead of a horizontal and vertical. Now down here we have the excluded zones. The excluded zones are basically margins. So if I have somebody on eagle eyes, I don't want them coming down here and opening up all of my programs, especially, think about it, if that click time was set on 0.3 seconds, that's going to open up three programs per second. So that means if you gave them five seconds on your desktop, everything would be open. <laughs> so the excluded zones, basically, once Eagle Eyes turns on, it creates a buffer. So I'm going to turn on Eagle Eyes real quick. It's now on. There you can see it. And I'm going to take it all the way to the bottom and see how I can't go. I can't get to those lower ones. And I go all the way to the top, and that's as high as it'll go. 
I go all the way to the sides, and that's as far as it'll go to the sides. So those excluded zones are very convenient to stop the, the user from accessing things they're not supposed to. Um, but they're also extremely convenient for, say, you're doing, using an activity that's not full screen. So maybe you have a window that's the size of the software here. Then you could adjust these uh, excluded zones down to you know 25% or 30% so that all they can access is that one small window. A lot of times when they're starting out, they don't have a full range of motion to be able to access a full screen activity. And so using a less than full screen activity is actually beneficial um, because it gives them uh, more movement and easier success to get that cause and effect. Now, setting those excluded zones probably sounds like a lot of work because you've got to try to figure out, okay, do I have it? Is it there? I turn on my console, I move my levers, I find out where my limits are, and I finally get it all set up. Well, that's a lot of work. Well, it's up here, if you go under File, I can save as many configurations as I want. So maybe for different activities, they like to use a different dwell time or recovery time. You can set those and then save them as a configuration. So save config as. Here's Joe's folder right here. So we open Joe's folder, and you can see he's already got some in there. So maybe we save a, an activity for him in here for something that he does. And we can say this is Joe's, uh, I'm trying to think of one, asteroid. So this is his asteroid settings. And then it saves it. So now the next time I want to open that, all I have to do is say file, open configuration. And I can now open that configuration right back up and save myself a bunch of time. Now, the last setting at the bottom here is the method to toggle the cursor. So right now, we have the external switch, which is located on the console that you saw me use earlier. Um, that's usually the easiest way, because you can see which one it's set to. But occasionally, you'll be in a situation where maybe you walk over to the computer because it's not right next to you, and you need to be able to turn off Eagle Eyes so that you can use the mouse. Because if I turn on Eagle Eyes and I try to use the mouse, I'll move over the cursor here so you can see it. There's the cursor. And then if I try to use the mouse, it won't let me. I have no control when Eagle Eyes is turned on. So in that situation, I'd have to walk back over to the console, switch it off, and then I would have control again. So in that situation, I could just turn on the control key. So now the control key is what operates. So if I push the control key, it turns on and it turns off. So. Those are the settings on Eagle Eyes. Um, fairly basic on how it works, uh, not too complicated. All of these settings are in order to enable them to have the success that they need. Now up at the top, there's a few more options. There is a default uh, setting, a default configuration. So if you want it to always open in a certain configuration, you can set that default. And then up here, we have two links, training. And if you click on the training link, it automatically takes you to our website where we have training videos, little 10-minute training videos to refresh your knowledge if you've forgotten how to do something, uh, tips and troubleshooting videos right there. Maybe you're having a tough time hooking up the electrodes. You can bring those up. That's my cute daughter. You can all say, ah. I think she's cute. Um, and you can go and scroll through these pictures and look at it and see, OK, that's how you do it. Oh, I remember now. Um, and get a better idea of exactly uh, what you're doing or if you're confused at all. Now, back in the software again, we also have activities. So right here, there's a link that takes you right to our website to the activities page. And then right here, we have recreational activities, educational activities, or the Eagle Eyes folder that we deliver with the unit itself, which is just cause and effect type activities. And I'll show you some of those in a minute. So right there, we can click in recreational activities. And we have a tab down here with beginner, intermediate, advanced, libraries of activities. And then a place where you can submit the ones that you find. If you have something that you really like to use, you can submit it, and we will add it to our library. So right there from the software, you have access to um, everything you need, and then there is a help button, which will also take you to an online manual, so you always have the most up-to-date information. 
um, or you can visit directly to our website. So that's the hardware and software. And now we are going to introduce Debbie. Debbie Inkley is the executive director of the Opportunity Foundation of America. And she is our guinea pig today. Good afternoon. So uh, Debbie, Debbie was kind of the one who uh, started the foundation. And originally, they actually worked uh, with a program called Boost, where they helped to teach um, people uh, skills, uh, life skills, job skills, to be able to get them back on their feet and, and get them out there. Um, once that program ended, uh, she was then introduced to Boston College and the rest of its history. Uh, and we are what we are today with Eagle Eyes. So what we're going to do is go through just exactly how to hook up the electrodes. So hooking up the electrodes, a lot of people say, oh, it's so time consuming. I hear that all the time. It bothers me because it only takes me about two minutes to do it when I'm really doing it. I get in, set it up. I'm, I'm ready in two minutes to go. So it really is just a matter of practice, just like anything that we do. So the first thing that we do is we take an alcohol swab and we're going to clean off the face. And the reason we clean off the face is not for the electrodes. It's actually for the tape. So the tape will stick properly and adhere. And the way that I like to do it is I just go in a rainbow right up the temple, over the top of both eyes, and then down the other temple. Um, and that way I just clean those areas for four electrodes right there. Now, when we do this with individuals, we want to always be careful and talk to them and tell them what we're doing. Um, you're about to get right in their face. So you need to be careful what you're doing and tell them what you're doing. Tell them, you know, hey, I've got an alcohol swab. Whew, kind of stinks. Can you smell that? Whoa. And they'll make a funny face usually. Um, and then let them know. Maybe rub it on their hand. Ooh, can you feel that that's cold? Uh, let them know exactly what you're doing. And then just tell them, I'm going to wipe your face with this now. And to me, it's asking permission. You're asking permission to get in their personal space and to do it. And the funny thing is, is how often they respond to it. I have parents all the time who grab the kid's head and I'll hold him down for you. Like, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Um, and when you ask permission, it's funny how they really do respond and they will react better to you than if you just get in their, in their face and go. So we're gonna wash. We're just gonna start on one temple. We're gonna take off all her makeup if she has any on. And don't be afraid to really cleanse it. And we're going to come all the way across the top of the eyebrows. And we're really trying to clean it because we want that tape to stick once we get in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do the last one is right underneath the dominant eye. Now, the dominant eye on somebody who's disabled is, is going to be the eye that has the best vertical movement because this is where the vertical one of the vertical electrodes goes. So... You can look at them, try to figure out which eye. Sometimes they have a lazy eye. So you want to figure out which one's the best eye with the best vertical movement. Now, for you and me, here's a cool trick, is to figure out your dominant eye. Point at something in the room that's small. So take your finger and point at something in the room that's small. Then close one of your eyes. Then close the other one. Whichever eye was still pointing at that item, that's your dominant eye. And it's not always the same as your dominant hand. So Debbie's dominant eye is her right. Oh, I'm right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come under the eye and we're going to wipe. Now, I'm wiping the cheek. I'm not wiping under the eye. Okay, this is the big no-no. Do not touch the soft spot under the eye. It's very annoying and the alcohol swab is a little strong. So we're actually wiping the cheek right there, even with the nose. And we're just going to make sure that's nice and clean. There we go. She's got a nice little red spot there now. Okay. So now that we're cleaned, one of the things that you can do is we have these nice little quick reference cards. They also make great fans to uh, get, all of the, get all the alcohol fumes off of there. And uh, this quick reference card is, is really good. It tells you the order that we're going to do it in. And so I'll put this up here on the camera. You see this quick reference card here. There it is. So that quick reference card just shows you right there. We're always going to go in the same order. We're going to go black, red, blue, white, green. Black goes on the right. Red goes on the left. And I know we should have gone red on the, red on the right. I always ask why that wasn't done. 
but red is on the left. Now the blue and the white are easy. Blue's on top, white goes on the bottom. Blue is the sky, so it goes on top. White is on the bottom like the snow on the ground. That's how I remember those. And those are for the vertical signal, and then the green is just the ground signal. Now the reason we do it in this order is because the horizontal ones are pretty easy to get on. Sometimes you can, if they're, if they're maybe seeming a little agitated the first time you use them, um, you can kind of, you know, sneak in behind them and get those electrodes on and you're not even in their face. Um, so we do those, those first. Then we do the blue on the top of the eye because that one's pretty easy. I can get in there and put it on top of the eye and not really get in their face. And then we do the white one, that's the sensitive one. I mean, that's right in their nose, in their eye, it's right there. So we kind of get in, we get that one done and that way if that one maybe makes them a little agitated, the green ones last because it doesn't matter where it goes. It just needs to be on the forehead somewhere. And so if they're a little agitated, we can just get it on and get out. Um, and so that's why the order is the way it is. So we're going to take it now. We're going to take our electrodes here. And we're going to start with our black. Now, the way that you can position the tape, you can position it any way that you need to, depending on how they are. So what we do is we rip our tape. We have our tape pre-ripped, five pieces that are about one and a half inches long, just a nice rectangle. And we have those all ready. And then we're going to use our electrode paste. And our electrode paste is, uh, it's kind of, it looks kind of waxy. And it sticks really well to the electrode, but not to the skin. Uh, these are called a wet electrode. They need a conductor in order to pick up the signal. What we then do is we take it and we scrape it, put our finger behind the electrode, and we scrape it just like an ice cream scoop. And then we get, you can see there's just a little bit of paste on there. It's a bit like a small chocolate chip. So zoom in there, hold it out. Oh, there it is. So you can see that, just a small chocolate chip of paste on there. Now, the cool secret is you can never have too much paste, but you can have too little. So if you err on the side of having more paste than not, that's OK. Now, the tape we can put on several different ways. One way, the temple obviously runs long ways on the face. So one of the ways that we can do it is we can put it like this, coming back over her ear like sunglasses. I'll turn that a little more so you can see. There we go. So it comes right back over her ear like a pair of sunglasses, and that her ear just holds that electrode out of the place, or out of the way. Now the other way we can do it, let's say they're laying, uh, they're laying in, a, in their chair. And so it's really hard to get behind their head. What we can do is come in from the top like this. So the tape still runs long ways, but the electrode would run up and over their head and over their wheelchair. So you can adjust the tape or the placement of the electrode however you want. The tape will always go in the same direction wherever you put it on the face. It's the electrode position that you can change in order to do it. So we're going to start out with this. She's sitting up, so we're going to do it just like sunglasses. So on this, on this right eye, I'm going to come in and I'm going to find there's that bone right behind the eye. And you guys can all feel that on yourself. There's a bone right there. And then there's that nice soft spot. And so I'm just going to feel for that nice soft spot right there. And to me, that's exactly where the electrode is going to go right on that soft spot. And then I'm going to push the tape on and seals around. Now the trick is you've got to keep the edge of the tape away from the crease in the eye because otherwise when they blink, it's going to fold the tape and be really annoying. So the placement of the tape is all about user comfort. It's not necessarily about electrodes, it's about user comfort. So I place that one and that's on there. Now we're going to go for our right one goes on the left temple, so we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to scrape it. Our other trainer likes to say, whenever you scrape your paste, just remember chocolate chip. Mmm. So small chocolate chip of paste. I take my tape. Now with your tape, just pinch it and hold it so that you're holding your tape in place so it doesn't fall off while you're placing the electrode. I come in from behind, and the reason I come in from behind is because part of it, the right and left are the mo ones that you can mess up the most because if I'm looking at her from the front, my right is her left. So doing it from behind helps you to not mess it up. So, okay, red goes on the left. There's that soft spot. I'm just going to place the electrode, wrap it behind her ear, and we're good. Okay, now we're going to come in, 
And we've got our blue one that we're going to do next. So I scrape my paste. Mm. And this one, you can do the same thing again. My tape is going to go across with the eyebrow. So I'll turn Deb here. My tape's going to go long ways across the eyebrow like that. My electrode can either go up and over her forehead, like if they're laying in a wheelchair, or I can go sideways and come back behind her ear. So somebody who is, moves around a lot, I'm going to want to do it exactly like I'm doing it on Debbie because I want the electrodes to be back out of the way so that they can move around and do their thing. If they're in a wheelchair, I'm going to run all the electrodes back over their head because they've probably got the supports that are in the way on their face and things like that. So I'm just going to come right in. I'm going to put the edge of the tape right on the top edge of the eyebrow, centered with her pupil, and run it right behind her ear. Now, one of the things that you can do, if the tape's not sticking, you can use your palm. This looks like I'm going to maul her, but I'm not. What it is is you're using the warmth of your hand to just help the tape to adhere. And so you can just use your palm, just softly push and do that. Now, you want to be careful not to push these electrodes on the forehead because our foreheads are hard. It'll squish all the paste out, and then it won't work because it has to have that paste to pick up the signal. Okay, now we're going to do our white one. Here's our white one. Going to go right below the eye. And this one, you usually are going to always do the same way. We're going to come in from the side like this and then go back over the ear. And the reason we're going to do that is because if you come down, there's going to be a loop, a wire loop, that they can then grab with their hands and pull off. So we're going to come down. Here's the trick on this one. And it's really easy if you remember the tape edges. Remember, the tape edge doesn't touch the crease. The tape edge goes right along the eyebrow. This tape edge does not touch the soft spot of her eye. You saw her blink there when I touched her. <laughs> okay. Do not touch the soft spot of the eye and don't touch the nose. So right here, there's this perfect little square on her cheek where that's going to go. And I run it back over her ear. And that's out of the way. And that's about user comfort. If you get it in that soft spot on the eye, they will start blinking and doing all sorts of things. So it's all about user comfort. Then we do our last one. We're going to go right up above or sorry, it goes above the other eye. I cleaned above the other eye. So we can just come right in and put it right on there. And this one's easy. doesn't matter where it goes. It just goes on the forehead wherever I cleaned with the alcohol swab. Tuck it behind her ear. And then we have just a little hair clip. You can just take a little hair clip, put the wires into a little ponytail behind her head, and now she can move around and be herself and she's ready, she's ready to roll. Now, it takes about three to five minutes for the electrode paste to warm up. It's the electrochemical reaction. And once it warms up, then it starts to work really well. Until it warms up, though, um, the, using the electrodes uh, is sporadic. So you do have to wait for that warm-up period before it does it. OK. Now, we'll show you real fast how to take them off. Once again, really easy. We're going to take them all off at once. Don't take them off one at a time and clean them, because then it just takes too long. We want to get in, get out. Don't want to be in their face for very long. Now, on the takeoff procedure, you can take them off in any order you want. Just do the white one last. And the reason we do the white one last is because that's the stinky one. That's the one that's going to agitate them, if any of them are. Now, most of the kids, once you do this with them, they don't get agitated. After the first or, sec or second or third time, they realize that, oh my goodness, this empowers me. And all of a sudden, they, they'll close their eyes for you and just wait for you to get hooked up. Um, so really, it's that first time that maybe they're agitated. After that, uh, I, I don't have any kids that really fight me at all because they know what they're about to get to do. So all we do is we wet the tape with a new alcohol swab. That kind of helps release the adhesive. Grab a small corner. And then I'm just going to rub in between the skin and the alcohol, or the skin and the tape with the alcohol swab, and literally, it's just falling off. I didn't have to peel it or pull it, and then I just leave that tape attached, let the electrode hang off the back of the chair. Now we're going to go for the next one. Now on the sides, we always want to pull down. And the reason we want to pull down is because that's the direction of the hair, and if you got it in their hair, it'll pull with their hair, not against their hair. 
You don't want to give them an, uh, an eye or a facial wax. <laughs> you really can hardly feel anything at all. So come over here, and you can see how fast, see if you get, once you get good at this, you can see how fast you can do the takedown and setup to where it really doesn't take much time at all. You can get right in, get right out. Now here's that one under the eye. This one you need to pull from the inside out. And the reason you need to do that is because if you pull in, it squishes the skin and you're gonna pull the skin. But when you pull out, it pulls against the nose and it pulls tight. So I'm gonna get in there, I'm gonna grab a corner, and I'm gonna just wipe real fast as I go and see how that pulls against the nose and so it pulls off. And then I just take my alcohol swab and finish cleaning off any little remaining paste. Okay, and that's it. Thanks to Debbie, She's our guinea pig there. And we'll show you a couple more things here. So the last thing on cleanup is all we do is we just take the electrode and we take the tape off, fold it in half so the sticky side's on the inside and then we just wipe the paste right off onto the tape and then start a little pile upside down and then we use our alcohol swab to then just finish cleaning off the electrode so it's nice and clean. So it doesn't take that long at all and now we can reuse that electrode next time. We have some schools that use the same pair of electrodes with like 10 different kids. So very easy to use. Okay. Now I want to show you some activities really fast, some of the activities that we use uh, with the kids and just give you an idea of the progression that we make with them. So the first activity that we use, and I always use this, this is called paint, and I always use paint to start with. So just like we talked about, there, there's that warm-up period where the electrodes have to warm up. And so during that warm-up period, I don't want to do a game with a purpose because they're going to get frustrated. So paint, all they do is move around the screen. That's just me doing it with my hand, but they move around the screen and they just make a, a painting. So there's no purpose to it. Their eyes can go anywhere. But during that warm-up period, what we're looking for is that we have controlled movement. Uh, if they don't have controlled movement, what will happen is it'll get stuck on the sides, it'll get stuck on the top. And so we're looking for those movements to then figure out when we're warmed up. So maybe we have to do it for five minutes. K, we're warmed up. We can troubleshoot to make sure everything's hooked up correctly, make sure that we didn't mess up, and then we're good to go, and we're ready to, to play. So that's just a simple paint game. Um, we actually took some drawings from this and made Christmas cards last year. The parents loved that because it was something that their child act actually did themselves it was with no help. So you guys saw aliens before. It's just a cause and effect. Hit the alien, blow the alien up. Um, so just this one's also really good for just letting them explore because that black background contrast is really nice and they just play with that crosshair to see where it's going. And so it's really nice that way. So then we move into games like this that are kind of a cause and effect. If they hit the target, the target does something. And then if they click, Five. it goes into a video sequence. Now, during the video sequence, you can watch what's going on, and you'll see that their eyes follow what's the animation, and so you can see where they're looking. And this is how we discover that they're peripheral users, is because if they are peripheral users, they won't be looking at the screen, but yet the cursor will be following the animation perfectly. And so we can use that to also evaluate. Also, during that animation sequence is a perfect time for you to make sure that everything's centered up uh, and the console's calibrated correctly and tracking correctly. So we have several of those kind of games uh, that do different music things. Um, then you can move into smaller targets. This is Banana Phone by Rafi, if you've heard of him. You can choose large targets or small targets, same thing. If I go over the target, it changes color. That helps me to know and to focus. Oh, it turned green, I'm gonna focus, and then it clicks. And Banana Phone is very long, so I'm not going to make you listen to it. But um, then from there, of course, we move into choice selection, like this animal soundboard, where they can actually choose an actual item and maybe have a favorite or a preference. You can also use this for memory. Hey, where's the duck? 
Do you remember where the duck is? Um, so games like that, as we start to progress, it also requires a lot more focus to hold that and to operate it. Um, now, here's another one. <laughs> All of the teenage boys love this one. So this is the uh, toot and reindeer, and they love to make music. All you do is when they mouse over it, it makes a noise. Sometimes these kind of activities are really good for someone who maybe isn't progressing. They don't get the cause and effect. And so what this does is adds an auditory element to it to where, oh wait, I moved my eyes and not only did something happen on the screen, but there was a noise. And so activities like this can be really good for those kind of scenarios. Um, then we can move into educational type activities. How many ducks are there? Do they know the number? If they click on the wrong number, nothing happens. So now they can do it, five little ducks. Now they get the reward. And they're all in British accents, so it makes it even cooler. Okay. Now, I want to show you here at the, the end here is this right now is a black screen. This is Herbie Speaks. This is the board maker. It's so easy to use. All you do is right click, add a new button. You can add as many buttons as you want to a board. You can go into edit mode. I can move it around. I can resize it. I can exit edit mode. I can go in and set the text. When I click on it, Hello. it speaks the text. I can change the color of the text, which also changes the border. And then what I can also do is I can set a picture. So I can set a picture on the button. And now there's a picture. And that's Kate. She's one of our star users. And she's dang cute. Um, and so you can set a picture on the button. And then once you have the button there, you can hide the text if you only want to use pictures, but you still want it to speak. And then you can also create, I can add a new board. So I can add a new board. OK, here's my new black canvas. Add a button. And then what you can do is actually take this button, or any button, and you can link it back to another board. So you can basically create a word book or a menu to where they can navigate and, and find it themselves. So I link it back to there when I click on it. And now it links back to the other board. Now, practical use, I can use this for communication boards. I can use it for education, for testing. Um, I can also use it for making games. So here's one that we just made. It's a butterfly matching game. So if you click on the big butterfly, can you find the picture that matches this one? If you click on the wrong one, Not a match. Try again. but if I click on the right one, Good job. You found a match. and then it sequences to the next board. So now if they get the right answer, it automatically goes to the next board because I've linked that to the board. So you can build an uh, unlimited amount of, of data or, or information that you want to be able to, to do with them where maybe we start out with basic matching uh, we move into colors or shapes or whatever is going to enhance the way that they can communicate with the world around them. Uh, and so that's Herbie Speaks, and that is that free download, Herbie.org, um, for that. And that can be used with camera mouse, that can be used with anything that you have, or Eagle Eyes, uh, either way. So that is our presentation. I don't know if we got any questions at all. Nobody has questions or they're all asleep. So thank you for coming to the webinar. We really appreciate being able to, to get this technology out there and to be able to make people aware of what it is and, and what it can do so that as you find people throughout life that can use this technology, you can help them to find us and, and we, can, we can improve the quality of their life. So thank you. We'd like to thank Adam and Debbie for being here today and sharing this knowledge with us. Uh, we'd ask you before you leave to take the evaluation. The link is on the bottom of the AggieCast page titled UATP Survey. And you're also welcome to leave ideas for future trainings that we can provide you with here. And just an FYI, this training will be archived after it is closed captioned. Uh, and DVDs will also be available. And I will send an email out about that when it is ready. And an announcement about our next upcoming uh, webinar that will be on October 29th. 
That will be on Go Baby Go, which is uh, alternative mobility for young children. And uh, we'll be having the Utah Center for Assistive Technology do that one. And watch for that announcement in your email. And we'd like to thank you for attending. And again, check out uh, all the parts of our program on our website, which is www.uatpat.org.